Can you beat Fire Emblem 6 without taking damage? Yes, and I'll do you one better by completing every optional chapter and the game's true ending. Let's lay out the rules. No damage taken. If any of my units take damage, I have to restart the current chapter. Allied green units do not count if they get hit since they aren't mine. No RNG manipulation. I will not break the dice in my favor. And finally, no emulator save states. What I'm doing here can be done just as easily on the original hardware. Assuming you can read Japanese, which I can't, I've, <laughs> I've got an English patch installed. Chapter 1 kicks off with a bunch of aggressive axe fighters charging my position. My strongest unit right now is Marcus, who takes on the initial rush of enemies by hoping that they miss. In FE6, the enemy loses 1 point of damage and 10% off of their hit rate if your weapon matchup is favorable, and Marcus can utilize all three types of melee weapons. I can boost my odds by taking defensive terrain where possible, tacking on an additional 20% to my evasion on top of an extra point of defense, allowing Marcus to annihilate the first wave of bandits with relative safety. That's all well and good, but we need a better long-term plan. Marcus has way higher initial stats than any of my other units, but he barely gains experience and also isn't likely to gain any useful stats when he finally does gain a level. Now that the pace of the map has slowed down, I can start training up another unit with greater long-term potential, and for that I choose Lance, a character with excellent speed that translates into high evasion. On top of that, Lance can also become a paladin, just like Marcus, and get access to the full arsenal of weapons, allowing him to bring an advantageous weapon to any situation. My second bit of long-term planning involves working on support conversations. Certain units can befriend each other by holding hands on the battlefield for an extended number of turns, and they gain bonuses to certain stats based on their personality. This is another reason to rely on Lance and Marcus early on, as they can not only support each other, but they can also get boosts from some of the other characters that I already have. My goal is to stack up a hefty plus 5 defense onto Marcus on top of a generous plus 25% evasion to allow him to tank enemies for me. Lance is taking a more offensive angle, building up plus 4 to his damage while still having access to a bonus 25 points of evasion. All of this sounds great, but it isn't as easy as it sounds. I can only gain 120 support points per chapter, and it takes 60 to gain one support rank. Thankfully, they start with a free 20 to 30 points, but going forward, I'll need to be very careful to not accidentally build support with the wrong units in order to build up my intended supports earlier. I can already showcase the benefit of my partially completed support bonuses, moving Marcus and Alan nearby, allowing Lance to efficiently take out an enemy by himself in one round of combat, granting him his first level up. I'll be moving my units in formations like this for the entire game, since you need to be within three tiles of your buddy in order to reap the benefits of support bonuses. One of my overall goals is to tightly funnel my incoming experience the best I can to create powerful units that can take on hordes of enemies by themselves without getting scratched, so I won't bother training up the cheerleading squadron. Nor do I have any plans to use Roy, despite his status as the main character. Sorry, buddy, you're... you're kind of mid. Wool to the Archer has famously poor stats, so I have him fire off a couple dozen arrows at the boss as a joke just to see if he gains anything. I don't plan on training him for actual combat, and despite gaining a couple of levels, he's still bad. This didn't really have an impact on the run since Wolt barely attacked after this point, and I never again used any form of unethical or repetitive level grinding. Chapter 2 pits us against a mix of axe and lance fighters, which is a great time to mention weapon accuracy in FE6. More specifically, the lack of accuracy. While axes have a bit of a reputation for their terrible hit rates, cheap lances really aren't much better. My goal for a character like Marcus is to leverage weapon advantage to simply evade enemy axes and lances, and I can rely on raw defense for the far more accurate but lower damage swords. Marcus himself has excellent accuracy no matter which weapon I give him, since I can extract a healthy plus 20% to his hit rates from his supports once they're finished, and his skill stat is actually really high. I'm given a pile of new units for free, uh, none of which I'm going to train. Healers can't really heal in this kind of run, the Axe Brothers don't have very good stats, and I'm choosing not to train the conventionally good ones. Shauna has incredible luck and speed resulting in a fantastic evasion stat once trained, but flying units can't benefit from defensive terrain, 
And her support affinity doesn't grant an evasion bonus, so I feel like her potential ceiling as an avoid tank suffers a bit. I'm also partial to units that can use axes, as the second half of the game is clogged up with tons of lance users. She's probably still really good, but I found success without using her. Deke's base stats are very solid, his support affinity is fine, and he can even use axes on promotion, but I'm just not a fan of his low speed growth, so I'm going to take a pass on him as well. I continue to feed kills to Lance wherever it seems safe, slowly clearing out the entire map. I diligently confirm that the enemies near the boss don't move in to attack even when you enter their striking range, but it turns out they have a rare AI quirk that makes them aggressive when you close in, and Wolt gets his face bashed in by the last enemy in the chapter besides the boss. I restart the chapter from the beginning, but Lance gets hit on turn 1, and I need to give it a third attempt. I hadn't taken a very large risk. While the game displayed a 13% chance for Lance to take damage, those numbers are lying to you. Accuracy in this game is weighted. Anything below 50% actually is less likely to hit than the stated value, and anything above 50% is more likely to hit. This helps nudge the outcome to be more in line with what people want to happen. A 90% chance to hit should hit, and a 10% chance to hit should probably miss. Since my typical goal is to reduce enemy hit rates as close to 0% chance as I can get them, this system really helps make my no damage strategies more likely to succeed. It's worth noting that this only applies to hit rates. Your chance to land a critical hit is exactly what the displayed rate tells you it is. I carefully redo the entire chapter, grinding out more supports, training Lance where I can, and also purchasing a mountain of javelins from the shop. Chapter 3 features a large number of aggressive foot soldiers that get totally obliterated by Marcus. A combination of poor play and bad luck puts me in a bad spot, but I don't get punished for it. Once Marcus has cleared out the initial rush of enemies, it's safe enough to continue training Lance wherever I can, using a naked Marcus to draw in weak enemies one by one for him to kill, which really ends up paying off over the course of the entire chapter. With the enemies methodically cleared out, Marcus thoroughly embarrasses the boss, and I move on to chapter 4. The main reason I spent so much time building up defensive supports from Marcus was to have a solution for chapter 4, which attempts to run you down with a pile of fast, aggressive cavalry with mixed weapon types that are difficult to deal with. With a plus 4 boost to his defense, base Marcus has exactly enough bulk to take 0 damage from enemy lances, allowing him to take on large numbers of enemies at once, thinning out the incoming waves of horsemen to where my other units can mop up the survivors. There is more to this chapter since I also need to prepare for some high damage reinforcements and recruit a couple of characters I actually plan on using. Clarine saves me some effort as she runs to Roy and recruits herself without asking for permission. I wish getting a job worked like that. She isn't immediately useful since I don't need healing and her staff rank is too low to use utility staffs, but she can provide support bonuses and give my units rides on her pony to get around faster. I do need her to recruit Rucker, famous for his ability to exceed 100% critical rates. Since Rucker is very fast and matches up pretty well versus the numerous axe-wielding enemies in the first half of the game, on top of having pretty convenient support partners in Deke and Clarine to stack up Avoid and Crit, I figure I might as well give him a go and train him up. While handling Rucker's incoming squad of baddies, I also need to take care of a stream of pirates attacking from the sea, but their horrid accuracy makes it easy enough for Lance to clean them up by himself, getting another great level up. With all of the side objectives taken care of, Marcus once again annihilates the boss with an iron axe and I spent a few turns making sure I've capped out on my available support points for the chapter before moving on. Chapter 5, which is boldly titled Fire Emblem, is a kind of filler chapter versus bandits where you can fight most of them on defensive terrain, providing a fantastic opportunity to safely train my weaker units. While this chapter is fairly simple, it's a great time to talk about how reinforcements work in FE6 and why they're so dangerous. In the other Fire Emblem games in the same era, reinforcements appear at the start of the player's turn, giving you time to react to their arrival before they get a chance to stab you in the face. Fire Emblem 6 does not share this philosophy of being nice or fair to the player, spawning in ambush-style reinforcements that run out swinging the moment you're aware that they exist. 
This is obviously a huge problem for me, so I heavily reference online guides and memorize the exact timing and placements of upcoming enemy reinforcement waves so I can fight them on my terms. Having taken out most of the enemies with Lance, I'm proud to watch him get a turn at taking down a boss by himself. He's rapidly approaching self-sufficiency, but he doesn't have nearly as much defense as Marcus. And Marcus still has a huge edge because he can use axes. Chapter 6 is another early game chapter I was seriously concerned about due to the column of enemies in the center that uses mixed physical and magical attacks. Enemy mages are extremely accurate and most characters by now have low to zero resistance, but the plus 5 defense bonus Marcus currently gets from his supports also helps with magic, and his excellent base resistance means he can take on mages with impunity, easily tearing through the entire enemy force by himself. A recruitable thief shows up during this chapter, but I just kill her without a second thought since you need to speak with her over three chapters before she joins you. I have to play most chapters pretty slowly to avoid getting hit and I don't have the luxury to sprint after her if she steals my stuff. I'd even go as far to say that Kath is arguably the worst character in all of Fire Emblem because the game actually gets easier if you kill her. There's two other thieves you can use, and you can also buy chest and door keys from shops if they're dead. Also, her combat ability is exceptionally bad, because she has 3 strength, can't promote, and joins at level 1 after the other thieves. I also got a new healer for free, and this one's actually really good, even for me. He starts with a C rank in staves, which is high enough to use utility staves like Barrier and Restore, which not only helps me deal with enemy mages down the line, but it makes it actually possible to train him despite the fact I can't usually heal my own units unless they recently gained max HP on level up. The boss is actually a huge problem since he's a magic user with enough damage to hurt Marcus, so I just roll the dice on Lance pulling through for me. Chapter 7 has a lot of moving parts. Ideally, I'd like to bail out the green units on the right side of the map, particularly because Zealot needs to be alive to access Chapter 20X. Thankfully, it's not a reset if they get hit since they aren't part of my army until I recruit them and it doesn't count as me taking damage. I camp out in the center of the map where the defensive terrain is, taking out the initially aggressive enemies. Enemy Wither Riders have enormous stats for this point of the game, but it's nothing that Marcus can't handle with a good weapon, and my other units are available to help clear out the stragglers. I didn't particularly care if Trek lived or died, since he isn't required for anything and <laughs> isn't very good, but by god did he fight for his life out there. I really do appreciate that the green units are trying to emulate the spirit of the no damage taken run, even if Trek did take one hit earlier. I was seriously concerned that Zealot would run somewhere inconvenient and bait out another Wyvern Rider or maybe even trigger the heavy wave of proximity based reinforcements up top, but he thankfully spun around 180 degrees to slaughter an unarmed man. Um, not cool dude, I, th I think that's a war crime. This translation patch precedes official English localizations for most of these characters names, so we ended up with a knockoff wish.com Jarrett instead of Zealot. Normally Zealot is a second Marcus who's a little bit stronger, but he's nothing compared to our trained and fully supported Marcus and his band of cheerleaders. While Wyvern Riders are strong and really tough, they tend to use Steel Lances or Javelins for the rest of the game, weapons boasting a slim hit rate of 55% which is fairly easy to reduce down to nothing with a good axe user. I'll be fighting these guys in bulk down the line and I want to turn Lance into a Wyvern Killing Machine to handle them for me. Things aren't over yet, there's a squad of cavalry reinforcements from the back, one of which has a dangerous silver lance, but Marcus has something even stronger up his sleeve. And for dramatic effect, so does Lance. There's one last pile of assorted flunkies that show up when you approach the boss, all of which get quickly routed by Marcus with the humble hand axe before he rolls up to the throne room to completely style on the boss with a double crit. He, he even gained speed! Marcus has been absolutely cooking for these last couple of chapters. Chapter 8 is a long, spiraling walk through large hallways peppered with enemies here and there. Since I killed Kath back during Chapter 6, she doesn't show up here and I can take my time when it comes to getting the treasure. In fact, not just Kath, but another thief was supposed to show up on turn 10, but since the spawning event is tied to Kath's survival, I have to deal with neither of them. I really wasn't kidding when I said her death makes the game easier. 
You get to recruit a pile of new units in this chapter, such as another free thief, as well as Lelina, a mage stuck in a cage who I forgot to move out of danger on turn 1, making me reset the chapter. On my second try, Lance got hit by a 9% display chance to hit, which has a true hit rate of 1.7%. I am not having a very good start to chapter 8. I successfully make progress on my third attempt, leading the charge with Marcus. However, we're starting to reach the point where his defense isn't going to cut it for much longer. He currently has 10 defense, on top of plus 5 from his support bonuses, but steel bow archers are a huge problem. There's no advantageous weapon matchup versus bows for extra defense or avoid, and they have enough damage to punch right through Marcus. Three more units appear in the corner, and they're famously kind of bad. Barf has potential to stack supports and become an invincible physical defense tank, but his awful speed means he'll never be able to kill whatever it is he's fighting, and leaving enemies alive is a liability. Wendy is even worse, and I feel like her low stats are self-explanatory. Now, Augier actually could have made a pretty strong avoid tank since he has excellent speed, luck, and access to axes after you train him, but his support affinity doesn't give an evasion bonus. If he had a better affinity, I would have used him instead of Rucker, since having access to axes is really good in this game, as we've seen on Marcus so far and will see on Lance in the future. Don't let anyone tell you that axes in FE6 are bad because of this thing or this guy. Enemy lances are by far the most common weapon type overall, which will really show in the second half of the game between columns of cavalry, blocks of wyvern riders, and even swarms of pegasi if you go Ilya route. Most of the enemies currently on the map arrive in a gentle trickle that makes them pretty easy to handle, so the main threat I have to deal with is a steady stream of reinforcements that threatens Lelina's prison cell, forcing me to run in and bail her out. This is actually kind of a problem since the aforementioned Steelbow archers are making a return, some of which are strong enough to damage Marcus if they land a hit. As soon as I've freed Lelina, I launch hit and run attacks while slowly backing up, picking off and separating out the incoming enemies so I can handle them one at a time without taking any risks. The boss has fairly high stats, but in typical FE6 fashion, his weapons couldn't hit the broadside of a barn, so I have Marcus brawl with him for a while before he finally goes down. Chapter 8X gets unlocked for keeping Lelina alive, and it's designed as a fairly safe training chapter populated with low-level enemies that are mostly stationary, making it surprisingly easy to get fresh low-level units like Lelina or Aki are caught up. While the high number of axe units in this chapter make for good training material, at this point it's become clear that training Rucker is going to be a side project. His limitations in this kind of run have become painfully clear the more I use him. Being stuck fighting exclusively up close only with swords makes him too inflexible to truly shine no matter how high his avoid and crit will be once he's a swordsmaster. While the era of Marcus carrying me will soon be replaced with the new age of Paladin Lance, I don't know if Lance can handle the entire game by himself without getting hit. He's gonna have a bad time with accurate fire tomes, long range magic, status staves, hyper accurate mana keats, and sand. I need to train someone equally as important as Lance. I need another high tier unit that covers his weaknesses and can solve the ever looming threat of late game map design. That unit doesn't exist, so I'm going to train Lelina. Yeah, I actually think she's going to be better than Rucker. Claiming that Lelina can be better than Rucker is a unconventional, bold take that would likely get you involuntarily committed to a mental hospital. However, the specific circumstances of my challenge run occasionally requires unconventional solutions, and that solution is starting with a level 1 child with 4 points of speed. I, I swear this is going to work. If I can get my hands on a strong magical combatant, I can match up well against Lance's shortcomings, taking down both mages and manikeets, on top of dealing with long range spells and even ignoring sand. I can have Lelina build supports of units that I'm already going to bring, so her cheerleaders won't have much impact on my total unit deployment. If I can crush FE8 without taking damage by using a bottom tier, I bet I can do it here too. Just abandon any sense of conventional wisdom and come along for the ride. I take out two birds with one stone by bringing along Saul to use the barrier staff on Lelina. Not only does this allow Lelina to brawl with the various enemy mages, something both Lance and Rucker cannot accomplish without serious risk, 
I also needed to start grinding Saul's staff rank, and this is a very productive place to be doing it. By the end of the chapter, Lelina has gained 7 levels and is considerably above average in terms of speed. Lance also delights me by gaining a point of strength when he finishes off the boss, which is almost enough to make me forget that my Rucker has gained 1 point of strength lifetime over like 8 level ups. Chapter 9 introduces Fog of War, restricting your vision of the enemy troops. This makes things pretty unsafe, particularly in a run like this, but I can greatly mitigate the problem by having Saul use the Torch Staff, which doubles as an opportunity for him to gain valuable experience and weapon rank. Thieves also make for excellent scouts since they have enhanced vision, so you're not in much danger from the unknown if you're careful. A couple of the enemy units are recruitable if you bring the right people to talk to them. Fur is essentially a gluten-free Rucker, and I don't really need another one, but I am happy to hire her on for the sole purpose of stealing her prized sword and giving it to Rucker because it has a 40% critical rate. Unfortunately for Shin, he wasn't carrying anything valuable enough for me to care, so I didn't recruit him. The Nomads are reasonably popular units to use since they're really fast when trained, but the late game route split is determined by whether you gave more EXP to Pegasus Knights or Nomads, and Chapter 20 on the Nomad route is kind of cursed, so I wouldn't really want to use Shin regardless. A fairly ridiculous number of swashbucklers swarm out of the ocean from turns 12 to 20, so I need to be prepared for literally two dozen aggressive axe dudes. The last time I saw this many fans of One Piece was at an anime convention. The bright side here is that the horde of weak pirates makes for excellent training material, and Rucker has a good matchup into Axe Fighters so I can have him camp out the beach and pick them off. I wanted to train Lelina as well, but she can only double the ones of Steel Axes, so I didn't get her as much EXP as I was hoping for. After cutting down pirate after pirate, Rucker finally gains a second point of strength. He's completely capped on speed, and he's still in single digit strength. I guess I shouldn't wait very long to promote him since he can compensate for a strength deficiency by abusing critical hits, and I'd really like for him to keep gaining speed and stack up more evasion. I figure it's maybe worth finishing off the remaining pirates beforehand while I'm still gaining experience from them, since that's going to dry up real quick once I promote and I might luck into some more strength. Which doesn't happen, so I just give up and promote him. Swordmasters are pretty wacky in this game since they have an inherent plus 30% boost to their critical rate, which when combined with supports in the Wo Dao can go beyond a 100% crit chance. For whatever reason, the next two chapters branch off into two individual routes with unique chapters, and it's determined by which one of the two villages you visit in the northeast corner of the map. My sole decision maker here is that one of these routes gives you an extra barrier staff, which makes it reasonable for Saul to complete his training. He needs to use a staff 50 times, and between two barriers, a torch, and the occasional chance to heal a unit that just gained a level or promotion, it's plausible to have him reach B rank in staves, upon which I can promote and send him all the way to A rank. Which makes it possible to grind up your staff rank for the warp staff, even in a no damage taken run. Big thanks to Mecha for kindly sharing the math on this. The last couple enemies before the boss propel Lance to a fairly high level, and I figure I've squeezed enough stats out of him by this point, so it's finally time to end the era of Marcus and crown our new king, granting huge bonuses to his stats as well as the ability to use axes. Our brand new paladin has zero issue taking down the boss, and we're ready to move on to chapter 10. It's a good thing I promoted Lance and Rucker last chapter because chapter 10 is a bit of a mess. I need to move fast to secure the loot from the villages, and I need to fight off both physical and magical attacks while getting attacked by reinforcements from three different angles. By now, Marcus has officially fallen off and can no longer handle archers nor mages for me like he used to, but our promoted Lance is an absolute evasion monster, handling all types of incoming damage while killing them back at range. The immediate threat is a pile of brigands threatening the valuable stuff, one of which can be recruited by Lelina, but she's not here right now, so we'll rely on Lance-style persuasion to get him to leave. These bandits will continue to trickle in for a few turns, so I park Rucker in a choke point to clear them out, freeing up Lance to deal with everything else. Now this is where things get real messy. A squad of Pegasi spawn in and come at me like a swarm of angry bees, and their high mobility is a real problem. I can recruit their leader and make the flunkies passive, but in order to do so, I need Klein, whose squad of archers is slowly approaching me from a completely different corner of the map. 
And to make things even more exciting, I also have cavalry attacking from a completely different angle, putting me in a three-way pinch. You can make this whole thing easier by having Tate's sister talk to her to render her passive but not recruited, which would have worked really well if I had remembered to bring Shauna. So let's figure something out. Since Tate's survival is optional, I have Lance start thinning out her squadron, but Tate herself freezes up in fear of having the fight Lance and doesn't move. At this point, I've realized she's so hilariously weak, I don't actually care when she finally musters up the courage to fight me since she has, like, six points of strength. Look, Tate, girl, it's chapter 10. This is ridiculous, go hit the gym or something. I have Roy positioned to recruit Klein for me, which will make his squad of archers passive, but he also freezes up and chooses to stand completely still. I guess he's scared of fighting Roy? That's just embarrassing, man. Between Klein, his squad of archers, and all of the cavalry I haven't had a chance to fight yet, I'm kind of in a tight squeeze and I need to huddle all of my vulnerable units in a corner as I pray that Klein decides to grace me with his regal presence. Apparently, Klein and Tate's AI gives them a 10% chance to stand still on any given turn, so it's kind of funny that it happened twice. After nabbing the loot from the villages, I am willing to donate the speed wings to Lelina, since Lance will almost certainly cap out his speed just by leveling up normally, and Rutgers got plenty to spare. It's already going to good use, since Lelina is able to show off her newfound strength by taking her first turn at fighting a boss, flexing the overwhelmingly high accuracy of the Fire Tome. Chapter 11 kind of sucks by virtue of being annoying. My movement is somewhat cut off by the enemy siege weapons, one of which can strike from 15 tiles out, which is mildly ridiculous. I can earn a strength boosting ring if I protect the NPC villagers, which Rucker needs more desperately than he needs oxygen. I'll have to send somebody to the west to clear a safe path for the villagers, made pretty easy since the game helpfully handed me a bard that can refresh a spent unit's turn, which is extremely helpful. However, stripped of his usual support partner, Marcus takes an unlucky hit since he doesn't have Lance nearby, which makes me rethink my strategy for the next attempt. This time I decide that Rucker can go and earn his own treasure, pushing west while his support partners skirt the edge of the mountain, scraping against the maximum range of the enemy ballista. Lance helpfully brings down the southern ballista, and I bring my army on a little expedition to train the Lena on the pirate reinforcements. However, since reinforcements move on the same turn that they appear, I couldn't exactly check the enemy's movement range, and I made the rookie mistake of assuming this pirate would be slowed down by having to cross the English Channel. Uh, yeah, no, my, my bad, I guess. Apparently, none of these tiles count as ocean, and any unit can walk over them with no penalty. I could have seen this coming, but, like, come on, there's, there's water right there! You'd get wet! It's time for take three. Using what I've learned, I execute the exact same strategy, the highlight of which is Rucker blowing up this druid with his 101% chance to land a critical hit. Rucker isn't anywhere as universally applicable as Lance is, but I have to admit he is more fun when he gets to shine. Once I've cleared out the enemies, I hang back and await the stream of reinforcements from outside the castle, which has exactly enough movement to go shoot Roy in the face. I am painfully aware that this no damage taken challenge is self-inflicted, but FE6 is going to make me go insane. After starting over and slogging through the entire map for a fourth time, I focus on training Lelina as much as possible on the stream of enemy reinforcements from the castle, earning me a truly excellent level up as a reward for my ongoing patience slash suffering. Lelina is starting to become very powerful, and I'm really excited to make her my next promotion once I max out her level. Chapter 12 is actually fairly simple, but I can't waste too much time since you lose access to Chapter 12x if you spend 20 or more turns here. There's a seemingly annoying series of narrow, winding hallways that pelt you with spells and arrows, but it's nothing Lance can't handle. He's been an absolute beast for the last several chapters. What's truly exciting is that Lelina just hit level 20, capping off with one more amazing level up and I go ahead and slam in that promotion, causing her stats to skyrocket. She's currently above average in terms of speed, even accounting for the speed wing, so we have been pretty lucky so far. Calf is supposed to show up in this chapter to steal your crap, but I once again do not need to deal with her as I dance upon her grave. You can get her recruited in this chapter, but it's still kind of annoying since she spawns pretty far from Roy and immediately tries to take your stuff. 
There's also a recruitable shaman in the corner, but I don't really care. The boss is extremely dangerous since he has a very high hit rate of 125%, making dodging a fool's errand. On top of that, he also has like 26 defense. However, Manikeets can't strike back at range and are weak to magic, so our superpowered Lelina has no issue one-rounding an enemy that no one else can safely handle. It's looking like her training is really paying off. Now, I don't have time to kill all of the reinforcements for experience, but Rucker did get a chance to style on this oddly high-level warrior for a healthy chunk of EXP. 12x is a gimmick chapter with 4 vision, telegraphed poison traps, a bunch of weak enemies, and a million treasure chests where only some of them are valuable. I care about my own safety more than I care about looting random antitoxins, so I decide to keep all of my units together and skirt the edge of the map towards the boss, using torches to scout ahead and stay out of danger. As a fun little trick, a druid hiding deep in the fog will attempt to snipe you with long-range magic, but Eclipse only has a 10% hit rate in FE6, so I'd be shocked if you managed to get hit by this. Rucker gained a point of strength after taking out said druid. Between this and a plus 2 boost from an energy ring I earned after chapter 11, he's finally building up decent strength, which he really needs because his supports don't grant any bonus might. I didn't manage to get all of the chests, but I did secure this gem worth 10k, which feels a little bit extraneous when I'm already sitting on a fat 50,000 gold. I do have a plan to eventually spend my money, but until then, I'm going to see if I can reach 6 digits. Lelena has started the casually one-shot unpromoted units, and she's taking out bosses in a single round of combat as well. While her support affinity does not grant an evasion bonus, and I can't really abuse the weapon triangle, She's gaining so much speed that she might be able to start dodging regardless, particularly since her luck stat is on track to greatly exceed that of Rucker and Lance. The reward for 12x is the S rank axe, which my Marcus can actually use, despite the fact that he joins with an E rank in axes. Since it gives a plus 5 defense bonus, he has 20 defense after support, so I might actually be able to pull out Marcus for an encore performance if I find myself in a pinch. Chapter 13 can be summed up as cavalry spam featuring aggressive formations of charging horsemen with more on the way as reinforcements from behind. Since most of the enemies use lances, we'll use our lance. It is. That joke wasn't funny when I thought of it, and it was even worse writing it down. An extremely good wyvern rider flies over and recruits herself. Melody is one of those characters who's unambiguously S-tier on account of her high stats and fantastic mobility, but I'm not interested in her since wyverns have a low speed cap, her luck stat is pretty terrible, and she can't utilize defensive terrain, so her evasion isn't actually very good. She can't use axes, either. The enemy paladins have really hefty stat lines, but Lelina can take them out reliably even without any support bonuses. Once my squad of super soldiers has wiped out the enemy cavalry, I move everyone to cross the northern bridge since the southern bridge is guarded by siege weaponry. Unfortunately, I learned the hard way that exactly one tile of the entire Northern Bridge is within range of the enemy ballista. I spend the next hour painfully redoing the chapter exactly the same way before finally bringing over Lelina to take out the boss in a single blow. Chapter 14 is the infamous desert chapter, severely reducing the movement range of most units. Making things much worse, my vision is also restricted by the sandstorm, and I'm also under a time limit in order to earn access to 14x. Lance has been heavily carrying the run for the entire mid game, but it's pretty difficult to use him here since his movement range has been slashed down to two tiles. Adding on more complexity, I also need to send a thief on a grand expedition to uncover some extremely important buried treasure, which reduces my ability to use them as scouts for the rest of my units. And since we aren't having enough fun yet, I'm also going to get attacked by high movement wyverns, a long range sleep staff, and a huge number of reinforcements. The wyverns in this chapter operate under a proximity aggro system, closing in to strike once you're within two turns of their movement range. By looking up their starting positions and very very carefully counting tiles, I can bait them out individually, letting me safely take them down before they fly past me and kill someone. Since Lance doesn't need to move very much to accomplish this, he's a great candidate for Wyvern Slaying. At the same time, I also have Lelina carefully draw in the second pack of Wyverns from the other end of the map. However, taking too long to clear out the flyers can easily get you overrun by reinforcements, and it's difficult to get Lance back in position to fight them. 
This is where Rutger gets to shine, holding off an entire flank without a single support bonus, but the south side is threatening to spill over and take me out. My saving grace is my overpowered Lelina. Magical units take zero movement penalties on sand so she can run back to help clear out the waves of brigand reinforcements while I wait for Lance and Rutger to get in position to hold them off on their own. Honestly, I'd be helpless without her since I still need to clear the chapter under a time limit and she can lead the charge through the sands, easily taking down enemy mages while also being my only unit that can handle manikeets reliably. The most important item in this chapter is the Warp Staff, which I will be using to bypass specific chapters. There's also some very valuable stat boosters floating around, in addition to the Silver Card, which grants a 50% discount in shops. Which means my 60,000 or so gold now has twice the purchasing power. After an hour and a half of looking up enemy locations and meticulously counting tiles, the only obstacle remaining is the boss, who has very high accuracy and a ranged weapon that always deals 10 flat damage from afar which cannot be reduced. However, there is defensive terrain within striking range of the boss, and since his weapon is technically classified as light magic during ranged combat, Lena has a weapon triangle advantage, and I might get lucky and take him out of a critical hit before he gets a chance to strike. Unfortunately, God hates me. This has been the most difficult chapter so far, and I get the unique privilege of doing it again. My second attempt is cleaner and less risky. I aggressively use my flying units as taxis to reposition my low mobility units, setting up Rucker and Lance to camp out where the reinforcements spawn within range of support bonuses. After an hour of careful play, I once more roll up on the boss and Lelina lands a huge critical hit to take him down for me, finally freeing me from this chapter. 14x is a truly awful chapter. The boss and his flunky snipe at you with long range magic and the floor will sink into the water if you don't run quickly enough, while enemy pirates and berserkers come at you like a swarm of deadly sharks. However, I've been preparing for this since chapter 8. Saul hit B rank staff back in chapter 13 and I got a second guiding ring at the end of chapter 14. It's time to promote Saul boosting his magic stat considerably and granting him an A rank in staves. I then break out the brand new warp staff and Saul has just enough range to teleport in Rucker, and I refresh his action to send in Roy on the same turn to clear the chapter if Rucker can take out the boss. Since the boss currently has his bolting equipped, he can't strike back at close range and Rucker has a powerful mix of damage, accuracy, and crit with the S rank sword equipped. Not only does he get a point of strength for killing the boss, but Lance was able to pick one up as well on a stray enemy, a series of good luck that makes me feel a lot better about having to redo Chapter 14. Chapter 15 has one essential item I need to move fast in order to secure, the Hammer and Staff, which allows me to repair damage items back to their maximum durability. Not only can I use this on legendary weapons, all of which I need to obtain in order to access the true ending, I can also use it to repair the Warp Staff, which normally only has 5 uses, of which I've already used 2 to clear 14x. However, there are brigands heading for the village, which is also guarded by a dense enemy formation of very accurate mixed weapon types that are too dangerous to run blindly into. I simply do not see a safe way to deal with the threat quickly, so I do it the unsafe way crossing my fingers and letting my favorite child stand on the floor and solo everything. She can even recruit the most dangerous of the brigands. Normally I just kill him for EXP, but I'm in dire need of more hand axes for Lance and I want to rob his inventory. The other main aspect of this chapter is a ridiculous quantity of cavalry reinforcements which burn through Lance's stash of hand axes and propel him to an A rank in axes, which is kind of impressive since he started all the way back at E rank when he became a paladin. While normally very good in a typical playthrough, I almost forgot to mention that I recruited Percival, since I don't need another paladin that's currently weaker than my extremely well-trained Lance. You only really need a few primary combat units, and I'm even starting to run out of use cases for Rutger going forward. His restriction to close-range combat is really limiting at this point of the game, and Lelina has become the primary boss killer as far back as Chapter 10. If you have a ranged weapon, you can strike the boss from some mountainous terrain with a plus 30% evasion bonus, so he's a complete joke. Chapter 16 has quite a number of mages to contend with, which Lelina can handle, but some of them are using long-range magic. The game has given me some new tools to handle this, such as a pre-promoted sniper who can shoot from free tiles out to take out the bolting mage. 
I also now have a mana key of my own who comes with an enormous plus 20 boost to her resistance, but using her offensively is quite restrictive since she can only attack 30 times over the course of the entire game. The real problem to contend with is that unlocking 16x requires one of the enemies, General Douglas, to survive the chapter. But you can't recruit him to your side, and he is not only aggressive, he also charges at you the entire time. You can attempt to run in circles so he doesn't catch you, but I have a better plan. Engage Operation Doorstuck. His AI is programmed not to attack your guard, as he is secretly the missing prince Douglas has been looking for, so you can physically block Douglas using a pacifist human shield if you can find a one-tile choke point to trap him in. I let Lance brawl with Douglas in order to lure him into the treasure room, very nearly killing him in the process, after which I escape and slam the metaphorical door. However, I moved my units so far back during the process of luring Douglas into the room that I got jump scared by a surprise bolting reinforcement that hit me at the furthest tip of his striking range, so I need to do everything again. I move more efficiently on my second attempt, sneaking in a cheeky treasure chest before clearing the room for Douglas to move into his new apartment. It's kind of like visiting the tigers at the zoo, the only thing separating us from mortal combat is a single layer of bard. The next order of business is the typical reinforcement spam. A thief can spawn here, which would be a huge problem since I can't lure him to the eastern treasure room where I am while the door is closed, but he doesn't spawn if you have either recruited or killed Cap. The combat reinforcements are pretty numerous, but easy to deal with since Lelina can tank the mages, simply evade the steel axes, and the accurate powerful mercenaries can be killed at range during my turn as they perfectly queue up, taking turns standing in front of Lelina and waiting to die. The boss is easy to deal with since he has really terrible accuracy, but I don't want to end the chapter until I get all of the treasure. I let the tiger out of his cage, drawing him close before giving him the loop, making him run in circles as he attempts to chase down Lance. Once I reach the treasure room, I have Lance drop off his passenger and I once again shut the door, keeping Douglas locked out as I rob his personal belongings. It's difficult to quickly describe how much of a nightmare 16x is. Half the tiles on the map are unsafe and can be randomly targeted by arrows of light. Plus these dangerous columns are completely unmarked. There's also a dizzying array of long-range magic to contend with. To break it down, there's three bolting tomes, two purge tomes, and these guys can run at you, a silent staff that can also run at you, and a 15-range berserk staff on the boss. My Lelina currently has 22 res. The stronger magic hits around 26 or 27, so if I top her off with a barrier staff every three turns, she can outlast the siege weapons until they break after five uses. However, this is where I learned that the enemy staff users hold their fire if they have a 0% chance to hit, giving me a false sense of security regarding the range of the Berserk staff, when Lance had a public meltdown in the middle of a Walmart. Starting over from scratch, I clear out the initial threats with Lelina and bring up Saul to assist with his warp and restore stabs, which is how I learned that the Silent Staff Sage can and will start moving in order to shut you down. Thankfully, this map has zero time pressure if you know where the traps are and I'm able to exhaust the enemy silence staff by holding my position. I'm going to end things quickly with a gambit. With silence out of the way, I top off Lelina's barrier one more time and I have exactly enough range on warp to skip ahead and teleport Lelina in range of four siege tomes and the boss. With her nuclear 30 magic, Lelina one rounds the boss without any help, disarming the berserk staff, and she's able to distract the siege magic for a turn buying me time to warp in Roy and end the chapter. The next four... hold on. The next four and a half chapters are part of the late game route split. Chapter 17 is a very basic chapter that creates a shortcut for you so you don't have to play it. There's a shop that sells some nice weapons, most importantly hand axes for Lance, so I roll up with 100,000 gold in my pocket and a 50% discount on goods and end up barely dipping into my savings no matter how much I buy. My units are very strong by this point, so dealing with the constant stream of weak reinforcements isn't very rewarding and is getting repetitive and tedious chapter after chapter. There's just too many trivial enemies, so I've completely given up on watching the combat animations for now. The main highlight is Lance getting S-rank and axes, completing the trifecta of melee weapons as Lance attains a transcendent mastery of all weapons known to man. 
To spice things up a bit, I spend some time training Faye on the Pegasus Knights, since her overwhelmingly high resistance might come in handy later. She gains levels quickly, but by the time I'm done, she only has 12 uses remaining on her Dragonstone, so even if I do find a use case for her, she won't last very long. I accidentally left Marcus in Ballista range, but he took a zero since he was holding the Armads. I, <laughs> I guess Marcus doesn't fall off after all. I'm still excited for the day that Lelina caps out her speed stat, but she doesn't feel like gaining any stats today, it seems. Chapter 18 is covered in a dense forest and a series of rivers that make it difficult to traverse on foot. You also need to weather attacks from a large number of enemy flying units that bypass the rough terrain while also contending with long-range threats like enemy ballistas and a charging berserk staff priest. This is all surprisingly manageable if you don't put yourself under any form of time pressure, since the wide swaths of defensive terrain let you take any fight with an avoid bonus. I am playing far too slowly to secure the loot, but I don't particularly need it since I'm rich and my units are very strong. The really cool gimmick of the chapter occurs on turn 7 when the rivers freeze over, but it doesn't mean much for me since I've barely left spawn and I'm not rushing to go save the villages across the water. Just like every other chapter, there's a big pile of reinforcements to take out, but they're still throwing weak, unpromoted enemies at me late into the game. I'm not a fan of the low quality, high quantity design of these chapters if I don't have anyone left to train, and my main carries are gaining all of 4 experience a kill. The boss hits a 29 of his purge tome, so I get some great use out of Faye by having her tank it for me of her enormous 33 resistance, and she obliterates him in close combat afterwards taking me down to 8 uses left on my Dragonstone. I think the person who designed Chapter 19 should probably have to go to prison. It isn't particularly hard, but relies on difficulty through obscurity, hiding long-range staves, ballistas, and flying units deep in the fog to ambush you. The game hands you an amazing late-game druid who comes with a very high magic stat and excellent staff rank, taking over the role of warp staff user. Teleporting Lance past the mountain to mop up a horde of enemies for me while hiding in the trees. I use flyers to transport my entire army to the south to get myself vision and support bonuses while I handle the classic weak trickle reinforcements, but I mistakenly thought that the Pegasi reinforcements exclusively spawned up north, so I need to restart and spend even more time turtling and spawn. I retry the same strategy where I aggressively move Lance forward, but he immediately takes a 10% hit and I need to start over. On my third try, I do the exact same thing, and Lance holds his position while everyone else sits and spawn for 20 turns, as the southern reinforcements run headfirst into Lance, and the northern Pegasi find their way over to Fort Lelina, upon which I do not grant them clearance to land. I very carefully inch forward, sticking to the trees while scouting for the maximum range of the ballistas since I can't be sure if they secretly have 15 range or the usual 10. My initial ploy to teleport Lance halfway through the map pays off since he was able to scoop up all of the brigand reinforcements, saving the village from destruction despite how slowly I played the chapter, and I raise his strength up to 20 to help me kill promoted units more reliably. Lelina then casually one-shots the boss, something that's become so routine I didn't even remember to turn the combat animations back on. I'm starting to feel like a broken record, but Chapter 20's main threats involve long-range magic, siege weapons, and status stabs. That being said, the enemy weapon variety is surprisingly diverse and dangerous, and there's a higher density of promoted enemies than usual, so it's not trivial to break through and make progress, particularly when they keep putting my units to sleep. Things aren't as simple as standing in a forest tile and hitting end turn anymore, and I find myself finally using Rutger again out of necessity, who has otherwise been fairly dormant since around chapter 14x. The central room is like walking into a firing range. There is a 15 tile range long ballista on the eastern and southern sides, plus long range magic coming in from the treasure room. Lelina has the resistance to take the magic, and she can exhaust the ballista ammunition as well since long ballistas are fairly inaccurate. Having played the last two chapters by turtling and spawn, I get a sudden harsh reminder that this chapter has a time limit in order to access 20x and I just missed it. I'm going to have to start over from the beginning. Given the difficulty of the enemies and the need to break through at a reasonable pace, things are actually getting kind of exciting. I abandon my conservative playstyle and take some huge risks on turn 1 in order to push inside as soon as possible. 
I looted a 5U Sporting Tome of my own a few chapters back, and I put that to good use taking down the Purge Bishop to create some breathing room indoors. I also have exactly enough range to eliminate a Ballista from 10 tiles out, showing how valuable it was to have trained up a maxed out mage as one of my main combat units. In fact, Lelina has just capped out her speed stat upon leveling up and her luck has gotten sky high as well, so her evasion is sitting at a comfortable 77% before any boost from supports, terrain, or weapons. With another use of bolting, most of the obstacles have been eliminated without needing to spend 5 turns at a time to exhaust their ammunition, and the Berserk Staff Druid is confined to the boss room and isn't really a threat by himself if I have a staff user on deck to undo the damage. There's a heavy trickle of random axe fighters from behind, which means Rutger has a job to do since everyone else is busy. He hasn't been around much since Lelina became god tier, so it's nice to have found something for him to do in this chapter. The boss has overall high stats and a reasonably high 97% hit rate, but it's nothing that Lance can't handle with weapon triangle advantage and a pair of cheerleaders. 20x is bad on account of being not fun. I used the Warp Staff and then Lelina killed the boss. Chapter 21 is a huge chapter littered with invisible reinforcement zones that will trigger waves of additional enemies if you end your turn inside of one. Thankfully, I can tiptoe around most of the reinforcement zones, and I warp Lelina past the first one in order to start clearing out the enemies as soon as possible since I am on a time limit in order to get access to 21x. Hitting one last milestone, Lelina caps out her EXP and hits the max level. Most of the enemies in this chapter are beefy wyvern riders, but they typically use fairly inaccurate steel lances and javelins, and there's plenty of terrain to take advantage of when fighting them. There are two large reinforcement zones boxing in the area containing the boss, one of which is a one-time ambush from a mini-boss dangerously close to spawn, so I pre-position Lelina nearby to fight him, but he's apparently too scared to fight the small nuclear child. I mean, I can't blame him. I wouldn't want to fight Lelina either. There's still an enormous reinforcement zone protecting the boss. Entering this zone will trigger 8 wyverns at once, which will repeat up to 3 times for a total of 24 fairly strong enemies. I split them up between Lance and Lelina. Taking them out is a bit tedious, but not dangerous since their weapons are very unreliable. There's a very powerful Bolting Sage down south, so I teleport in to save me some time, as I'd otherwise need to bring over Faye to safely exhaust his ammunition over several turns. I theoretically could have attempted a warp skip past the 30 or so reinforcements I had to deal with, but Lelina surprisingly does not one round the boss without a lucky critical hit, even with supports and the four blaze, so it was too risky to attempt. I still have a special errand to run. There's a secret shop hidden away in the corner of the mountains, and this is what I've spent the entire game saving my money for. You can not only buy stat boosters here, I've also got my eye on the stock of bolting tomes for Lelina. In total, I blew my entire trust fund, purchasing 10 boltings, 15 pairs of boots, 5 dragon shields, 2 talismans, a goddess icon, and a body ring, spending 110,000 gold. 21X is mostly dedicated to using my new stat boosting items. I distribute 5 of my boots to Lelina, raising her movement range to 15 tiles. The rest I give to Roy and my bard so I can follow her around more effectively. Lance pops 5 dragon shields to max out his defense stat, which is now up to 30 with the armads, and Lelina uses the rest of the miscellaneous stat boosters to hit her final form. I wanted to warp skip straight to the boss, but you can't warp to tiles you can't see, and I needed to go around to the side to get vision on some of the threats. From here on out, every time an enemy even looks at me funny, I'm going to have Lelina call down the Wrath of God to take them down from a safe distance. The enemy druids in this chapter do 37 damage or some other ridiculous number, but I'm not about to find out how much damage they actually deal. Upon completing the chapter, Roy gets the latest promotion of all time, upgrading from level 1 to level 1. The Fire Emblem, Binding Blade, is actually very strong and can strike at range, but I never trained Roy so I don't care right now. Chapter 22 is where the game normally ends if you don't do all of the optional chapters and unlock the true ending, 
and it's meant to be a grand, difficult, large-scale finale. But it's actually not very hard, since my juiced-up Lelina can move 15 tiles at once and also strike from 10 tiles away, obliterating any remotely threatening enemy with a stray thought. The gimmick of this chapter is to split your army in two halves and press the switches in the corners of the map. Lelina's side quickly clears out the right side of the map, and I deploy my capped defense lance on the left to blast through the enemies with his full arsenal of S-rank melee weapons. The interior chamber with the king inside is kind of a problem since it spawns powerful ambush reinforcements every three turns. However, this is only hard-coded to work until turn 45, and I can just wait until turn 46 before opening the door. Still high on the power of my juiced-up super soldiers, I kind of forgot that King Zephiel's chamber contains a mixed squad of highly dangerous enemies too risky to tank or evade in direct combat. So I just back up and fire off boltings until they're dead. King Zephiel himself is far, far too powerful and accurate to risk fighting up close, so I ruthlessly cheese him out by calling in an airstrike on his position. Queen Lelina is the true secret weapon of this challenge. I've been preparing for this moment the entire game when I announced my intention to use her back in AX as I had no other plan to reliably take out Zephiel without taking a huge risk. It's truly delightful to bask in her glory as she casually breaks the endgame chapters in half without even trying. Chapter 23 brings back all of the FE6 map design staples for one last hurrah. We have ballistas in the center, a hilarious quantity of strong wyverns to contend with, and, of course, the usual status stabs. I still have plenty of boltings left over, so I remove an inconvenient ballista and start working on the flock of wyverns. As a way to help you kill wyvern lords in chapters 21 and 23, all of the S-rank weapons deal triple damage, and with the game more or less over by this point, I have Lance go sicko mode with the armads, dealing over 60 damage a hit while flexing 30 points of defense just in case they manage to sneak in a hit on him. The elite squad by the boss is surprisingly difficult to crack. The boss has a 35 damage bolting, Plus her druids have enormous magic stats of their own, which they use to throw sleep and berserk stabs at me. I toss a couple more uses of bolting at the snipers to pare down the enemy to exclusively magic users, and I move up Faye for her moment of glory as the bolting tome fails to damage my invincible chicken. Faye not only storms for the ranks of the enemy druids, she also proves to be my best shot against the boss whose ice spell cannot pierce Faye's fluffy exterior. I'm down to a single use left on the Dragonstone, but Faye has done a great job. She's earned herself a pat on the head and can sit out the rest of the game. Chapter 24 is a place to showcase the culmination of my prep for the endgame. And by prep, I mean Lelina. Every single enemy is a mannequin who are far too accurate to risk taking on in close combat, but my hilariously overpowered child can take them out from range without even using an S-rank weapon. To progress in the chapter, I need to have Roy seize the thrones like eight times. This is why I gave so many pairs of boots to Roy and Elfin. I can sprint ahead of Lelina, refresh her turn to take out both guards, and then Roy can roll up to the throne. Since the Binding Blade is triple damage versus dragons, I can actually let Roy meaningfully fight for the first time since Chapter 4, shipping down the mini-bosses to bring them into one-shot range for Lance to clean up. And since this chapter is extremely repetitive and overall poorly designed, I repeat that exact sequence of events seven times in a row because every single room full of dragons is exactly the same. I do get chased by reinforcements, but they don't have a hope of keeping up. My kill squad is moving in 15 tile increments. The final Maniki has considerably higher stats and more chest hair than the previous two dozen dragons. However, despite building up his power for the last 1,000 years, he goes down in a single blow from a 14-year-old child. That's the beauty of Fire Emblem right there. We're entering the final showdown versus the Demon Dragon. This chapter is where the budget seemingly went dry as it's the shortest and easiest final chapter in the series. There's no need for tricks, the final boss doesn't even strike back at range, because they want you to fight her with Roy even if you didn't train him. Lelina applies some chip damage with the Four Blaze, and I bring up Roy to finish the job since the Binding Blade does insane damage no matter what your stats are at this point. After refreshing Roy's action, I go in for the final blow, completing Fire Emblem 6 without taking a single point of damage. At a monstrous 386 kills, 
Lelina took home the title of MVP over the course of the entire run. Not only did her unique set of strengths utterly demolish many of the late game challenges, she also secured the highest number of kills because of her overwhelming offensive power. While I had planned from the very beginning to use her, her performance greatly exceeded my expectations, even becoming an avoid tank thanks to her lucky speed growths and more typical high luck. Not to be outdone, Lance took home a tremendous 346 kills. His high speed, great support bonuses, and mastery of all three weapon types made him an incredibly flexible and easy to use unit that was putting in work as early as Chapter 1. While Lelina eventually took over as the primary carry, I truly could not have done this without Lance, and he shared an equal burden with Lelina in many late game chapters without even breaking a sweat. Rucker comes in third with a much more modest 125 kills. While I don't want to downplay his useful contributions in the mid game, he was unexceptional before promotion and more or less vanished during the home stretch since I didn't have any further use for a one range sortie. Rucker is ultimately just okay on normal difficulty, you simply don't need his critical hits to kill the average enemy, so the hard mode Rucker of our dreams will have to shine on in another playthrough. Marcus, however, absolutely made this run possible, even though his viability ended the moment Lance became a paladin in his place. His initial bulk on top of his defensive support affinity made the early game possible while Lance was getting up to speed. Considering Marcus barely got any kills after chapter 8 or so, I consider his 121 kills to be exceptional, and I'm proud of grinding his axe rank up from E to S. And of course, I also need to thank all of the utility units that made the main cast shine. From staff users to support partners alike, it was a large cast of units that greased the gears of war, even if the glory was attained by a select few. I'm grateful I got to share this adventure with you. To those who watched my streams and kept me company, thank you for keeping me sane as I spent a few dozen hours obsessively counting tiles and crunching numbers in my head. This video took me a long time to put together, so please subscribe if you don't want to miss my next big release. I've got more videos on the way. I don't want to compromise on quality by churning out videos, so if you want to support my channel as I work on big projects like this one, I went ahead and launched a channel membership. It doesn't do much, but you can post a little picture of a shark in the chat when I stream, and I'll chant your name three times in front of a dark mirror every single night at 12am. Either way, Thank you for watching all the way to the end. I hope to see you again soon. Cheers.